a couple of them uh, are closing Rikers Island. It's very challenging. Uh, the mayor has put all four of the boroughs under one EULA, and people are really upset. So in the borough of Manhattan, we had thought that the tombs, which is 125 White Street, was going to either be renovated or converted to a uh, prison jail. But then the mayor came up with um, another building right next door, 80 Center, which has the marriage bureau and offices from the DA and others. So it's created great habits. The Chinatown community and I feel like we got duped in the middle of August when the community boards weren't even meeting. So just so you know, that's ongoing and we're very frustrated, but uh, that's what's going on. The L train doesn't impact this part of the community a lot, but it is. Um, we got a lawsuit that came up. I have to think say the MTA and the DOT have been collaborating with the community. I organized a bus trip from Brooklyn to Manhattan, which gave a sense of what the routes will be. And we've been bringing all the agencies together on a regular basis just to talk about how they can work together with the community. So I just, it, it's uh, challenging, but I do think the agencies are trying and they have a big problem for 15 months because the buses that are coming to that part of Manhattan still in most cases have quality of life, meaning they have, they're not clean and with very challenging for those who live in the community. Uh, you know that we have uh, a youth uh, program, youth council and those applications for young people who want to apply are due October 29th. Um, we have launched what we call BP on your block. Um, so we're gonna be going to different neighborhoods uh, around the borough of Manhattan to talk, uh, just listen to people's issues in the community. So I, if you wanna do something in board seven, uh, please let us know. Uh, in terms of seniors this summer, as some of you know, here at Fordham Law School, we had a huge program on seniors, art and the aging, and it was incredibly pow powerful. 1,500 people showed up. Um, and we continue to have the um, food bag program from the top of Manhattan to the bar bottom, but it started here in on the west side, as you know. Um, in terms of budget, we will, uh, I would say not now, if nonprofits, schools, people who work in parks, et cetera, want capital funding that will be available in terms of the application in December. But this is the time to meet with us to go through with Vanessa Diaz, the budget director, what kinds of um, program you're thinking about for your institution, because capital money is basically bricks and mortar, technology, et cetera, to make sure that the Office of Management and Budget signs off on it. Because if they don't, then we can't give you funding. Um, we are uh, soon launching in the fall the Community Board Leadership Training Series. You know, we. Uh, it's open to even more than community boards. I think if others are interested, but we do technology, data mapping, land use, resolution writing, ethics, uh, parliamentary procedures, almost like an academic semester, and we're all, you're all welcome. Uh, further south, NoHo SoHo, we are going to be working on a study with the City Planning Commission on the rezoning of that area. It's quite out of compliance, not dissimilar from the Garment Center. Nobody ever paid attention when Nike moved in and it's supposed to be light manufacturing in Noho Soho. Same thing in the Garment Center. Um, the Garment Center, uh, two years ago, the city said, the Garment Center is moving to Sunset Park. And I said, hell no. And so to the credit of the city agency, the Economic Development Corporation, they've now been meeting with um, landlords. So we have, Tax abatement for owners who will sign up, and the mayor has agreed to help us buy a building um, for garment center use and manufacturing exclusively. Um, and so we are working to do that while lifting the preservation zone. We're working with the community boards in that area. Very challenging, but at least we see some light at the end of the tunnel for incentives for owners to stay in the manufacturing field and not just become office space. Um, we have worked in Harlem, uh, again above us, to keep a uh, Harlem Historic District. They feel very underrepresented in terms of being landmarked and having historic districts. So those are some of the things that are um, very much on our mind. Here, of course, in Community Board 7, I feel inundated between 200 
Amsterdam, all the work on 66, 65th Street that these amazing residents are doing. And now your chair and I realized that the church on 92nd and Amsterdam was also trying to build a tall building above it. Ugly in my opinion. Nice to see the so these are really huge challenges. Um, I had a big fight with the city planning commission today about Thank three buildings uh, on two bridges between the Williamsburg and the Manhattan Bridge. So always on the development side is a challenge. Um, uh, you should know, I'm sure you do, that the weekend of October 13th and 14th is open house across the city. You get to go places you don't normally go. And we have some 1811 maps that are gonna be down at the municipal building. You're certainly welcome to, uh, to join us. Um, and you know our office continues to be uh, accessible on 125th Street. Um, the other meeting that's of some interest is Saturday, November 19th, way in advance, called My Brother's Keeper. Um, this is for young men of color. Um, we did it in before. We bring all of parent leaders and young, um, leaders of nonprofits working with young men of color. It's going to be at 240 East 109th Street in a, in a school there, but it's open to the entire, entire city. Um, I just want to mention that there will also be, and it's in the material on the back there, there will be a whole series of uh, capital funding process um, forums from November 7th all the way uh, the 8th or 14th on the 5th. The information's on the back in order to be able to apply for capital funding because we really want you to get it. We try almost everybody who applies one way or another. We try to make sure that they uh, they get they get funded. Okay, that's a quick version of some of the issues that we're working on. I want to mention that um, I I think the other challenge that we have all the time, and I keep emphasizing it, is what are we going to do about this development? Because I cannot seem to crack it in the mayor's office. Um, okay, now I'm an individual citizen. Just so you know, I'm not a borough president because I can't do what there is. Um, the issue is there are two charters. It's very confusing. Uh, as the council member and then as borough president, uh, as borough president and council member, I had a bill on charters, and it said we should have a full charter revision commission, not dissimilar from 1989, 1990, for those of you who were alive then. Not everybody was alive then. And in that particular case. The public advocate came to be, the uh, Civilian Control Review Board came to be, and there were many other uh, innovative ways in which city government changed. So uh, the public advocate and I and the speaker introduced a bill, 2017, 2018, we did the same thing, and that bill passed, the mayor signed it. But at the same time, the mayor decided to do his own commission pissed me off. So we ended up with a commission that uh, had hearings for the last, I don't know, seven or eight months, some of them during the summer. And I don't think that most people knew there was a commission taking place. Bloomberg had similar commissions, Giuliani, et cetera, where it wasn't a full commission and it was appointed just by the mayor. So the commission that we did has started their hearings. They had uh, open hearings in the five boroughs in the evening so people could participate. The mayor's commission was during the day. And the uh, commission hearing that took place recently in Manhattan went from 6 p.m. to 1.30 a.m. And that commission, which is the one that the speaker and I and the public advocate uh, path includes representatives from the borough presidents, the city council, the mayor, the controller, and the public advocate. So it's a wide group of viewpoints. And at all of these commission hearings, all five boroughs, they had lots of views. Budget, land use, everything you can think of. Animals, you can imagine. Everything. And that will include your vote November 2019. So you've got lots of time. There'll be many more hearings. Uh, Jim Karras is our representative from Manhattan. You can call him, call our office, and he'll come and talk to any group, black association, whatever you want. At the same time, in November of this year, you're going to have to vote. 
you have to vote between three on three propositions. One has to do with campaign finance. I don't care what you do on that one. What's weird about that one is on the city council, we can vote on it, but okay. And then there are two others. One is about civic engagement. It sounds nice, um, but it's not exactly a clear civic engagement commission. It, it's basically a proposal to establish civic engagement commission that would be permanent. Um, it's supposed to provide resources and assistance to community boards, but I think the borough presidents do that now. So I hope we do a good job and I hope that you think we do, but it, to me it will be confusing to have some other agency do the same thing. Um, I think it's not necessarily well thought out and I don't want to vote for something that's not well thought out, a commission. So that's number one, I'm going to say no. The second one, the second one is one that I feel even more strongly about, number three, and it says there should be term limits for community board members. Let me tell you why it's of concern. I was on this board for a short period of time. Those of you who've been on for short or long terms know that land use is challenging. Historic preservation is challenging. Figuring out about state liquor authority is challenging. You don't learn that in eight years, which is what the proposal is. And when new people get on, I want them to stay so that they can take on the developers and take on the people who are not term limited. If you think a developer is term limited, let me know. If you think a land use attorney is term limited, let me know. If you think an engineer who spends a lot of time working on land use is term limited, let me know. In order to counter this, you need the kind of expertise that the amazing members of Board 7 have developed. Even to know transportation, to know sanitation, to know the parks, takes more than eight years. So I am dead, dead against number three. It's a challenge. It's a challenge because in some of the other boroughs, four borough presidents signed my letter, uh, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, and Manhattan. Eric Adams, who's a good friend from Brooklyn, he supports term limits for community boards. Okay, we're going to go around getting him behind but the point of the matter is, I think that you understand, and I need help. I need help reaching out to your other community boards because I don't know that all the other boroughs understand the importance of this long term because you have experienced land use expertise and the need for it. And I don't know that all the other boroughs have had the onslaught that you have done so well with. So. That's my message is no on two, no on three, and you can decide what you want to do about campaign finance on number one. Um, so I hope that you will help us. Obviously, it is a November 6th election this year, so most people will not know to turn the paper over and, oh, there are three issues here that I need to educate myself on and that I need to vote on. So I urge you to tell people what to do. So now I'm back to Borough President Gail Roa. So now we would like that woman in the pink sweater to come up here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know I speak for an awful lot of people. Gabby Powell has been a thorough and insightful community board member for the duration of her tenure, placing the needs of the community in front as a priority. She has unfailingly courteous to applicants in front of the Preservation Committee, members of the community and board members, while at the same time stating her own thoughtful views clearly. She listened to the concerns of neighbors that went beyond the scope of preservation and worked to ensure all concerns were addressed. She's a consummate professional, diligent and conscientious, a member who was determined to make each project the board reviewed as appropriate as possible. 
Gabby garnered the respect of preservation professionals appearing before the committee, and she had a great hand in shaping the results. Even in disagreement on applications in front of her, her detailed accounting both educated and clarified many a scope of work to make applicants come back to the board in a stronger, more neighborhood-focused way. Her kindness and collegial spirit will be missed by her Community Board 7 colleagues. And she said she can't give her whole to the board at this time. That's why she is unfortunately not able to continue as a member. So now, therefore, I, Gail Brewer, as your borough president, do hereby commend this amazing Gabby Pallets for contributions to our beloved New York City and proclaim Tuesday, October 2nd, 2018 is Gabby Pallets Appreciation Day. <laughs> is so thoughtful and so active and so engaged and really cares about the needs of our community. And I'm proud to be a part of that. And I, as Gail said, I, I really do step down because I can't give it my all right now. But I, I treasure every, almost every day. And sometimes <laughs> it takes a little long, but it's been, it's been such a pleasure and an honor. And I will not, um, I will not make myself scarce. So thank you, but I do. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And they all, quite a few of your, your colleagues have contributed to the, to this beautiful project. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm now going to um, open the public session of the Bernie City Martin Chair of Studio 7. I'm going to call on Scott one minute. First, I'd like um, a motion to approve the minutes from the September meeting. So uh, is there a second? Second. All those in favor? You want to keep going? Oh, sorry. One, two, three, four. Oh, again. Here again. Yes, sorry, sorry. I thought you said again. I can't tweet it. Again. One, two, three, four. Again. No, I can't do it again. Is anyone against the minutes? No, it was against them again. Okay. I am now going to call the one abstaining. Two. Two abstaining. 31 0 2 0. I'd now like to call on Scott Stringer, our city controller. Okay, well, good, good evening, everybody. And from time to time, I'd like to come. Uh, back to the community boards to give a very quick update because I remember when I was borough president, you gave me more time and you control it, you get less time. So I understand the rules, but I just want to say one of three things back here and a couple things I just want to let you know we're doing with our office. The first is uh, this past week we sent out a report that shows the dire crisis we have as it relates to affordable housing, not just in Manhattan, but the entire city. Since 2005, we've lost around 425,000 apartments in East Durant for $1,000 or less, probably than worse, not just in our community on the Upper West Side and throughout Manhattan, but it has now become a genuine citywide problem. And part of the battle that's going to be waged in Albany is going to be about not just renewing the rent laws, but whether we in fact can control or whether we can pass laws that will close some of the dangerous loopholes that we've been dealing with. And one of them is vacancy control. 
the other are pass alongs on MCIs, and we have to start organizing now to bring people to Albany. A lot of this is political, but I do believe that we will have a Democratic majority in the state Senate. So it gives us a real opportunity to sort of take a refresh and see what we can do to close the loopholes that will allow us to preserve the affordable housing and the people in our communities that we made our neighborhoods so valuable. Long term, I do think we have to look at the way we're rezoning the city and start thinking about a plan to build the next generation of affordable housing in the realm of public housing and Mitchell housing. This is going to be the future of whether we can create a city for everybody. But I do believe that simply giving rezonings to benefit real estate developers who build a little affordable housing, but it happens to be unaffordable for the communities that have to take that housing. It's really unaffordable affordable housing if there's such a thing. So I hope to come back here and talk to you more about that. I also want to leave you with uh, a book that we just released in our office, 65 Ideas for the Charter Vision Commission. This is not the Charter Vision Commission proposals you will see on the ballot in November, but these are ideas about, thank you. Uh, these are ideas for the yet another Charter Vision Commission that does have an opportunity to meet the needs and the ideas of what we're talking about. I agree with our borough president, and I just saw your leaflet. These proposals that are on the ballot in November should not be supported. This Charter Vision Commission had virtual no impact from anybody. Anyone who knows about community boards and the work that you do, term limits means less debate, less dissent, less challenging city agencies and developers. We in Manhattan take our community board very, very seriously. And I would say to you, Gail, and around the city, there are community board members that really dedicate themselves. We should not be limiting terms when there was virtually no discussion as to whether that's a good public purpose. And again, I agree with the borough president. When you talk about civic engagement, well, there's a whole lot that goes with civic engagement. So the proposal has a good chance to pass because it sounds so good. But the reality is that when you dig deeper, we should have a different conversation. How do we empower community boards? How we mandate urban planners on community boards? How do we enhance the work that you do? You're the first line of defense for our communities. We should start treating you like that. And then there are the larger issues about having a chief diversity officer, empowering people of all different backgrounds on procurement, and all the issues of city government that a real charter vision should be focusing on for the last year. So I wanted to put this out there because I can't help myself. But second, I do want to work with all of you, borough president, city council members, to create a city government in 19 to be ready for what's going to be an entire changeover of city government in 2022. We have to get this right, quite frankly, we shouldn't have a charter vision. And the last point about the history of charter visions, they are usually created to meet someone's political agenda. Giuliani didn't like Mark Green, so we had a charter vision commission to do away with the office of public action. And other times it was a charter vision to deal with nonpartisan elections, but that was a very partisan question of the Mike Bloomberg. We have to be careful about why charter vision commissions are set up in the first place but I believe this one has a real chance to deal with some of the crucial issues facing us. So I'll leave you with this. Good luck with the democracy called elections. And it's great to see everybody from the neighborhood. We'll see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to give a, I'm going to give a very quick chair's report. Um, I want to congratulate the um, group that did Parking Day, which was a pop-up park, Jody Sperling, Sarah Lynn, and um, Tina, Tina Nitsky for her idea to, to create Parking Day. It was a great success. We're going, we have some pictures that we'll put up on the website. Um, and for those of you who missed it, you missed a very fun day. We had da Dancing in the Street by two different professional dancing troops. Uh, the NYCHA Forum on Secession was postponed because we couldn't get the publicity out in time. So we are working with Board 9 to create a new, a new date. Um, the Charter Revision Task Force, we have notes and information and we hope to be either the end of October, the early November. And I just want to remind everybody that the DNS is due ASAP. 
Um, if your committee has not finished it, please get it to Mark Diller immediately. And on the 16th of October at our steering committee, we will be discussing the budget priorities for, for the 2020. 20, 20. 20, 20. Okay. And now we'll start the public session. Here I go again. I'm going to try and be more delicate. We're going to try and keep the public session and the electric comments to finish by eight o'clock because we have a, a very full agenda. So I hope everyone will come. Our first um, speaker is Jerry Bergman. <coughs> Yeah, I can break the mic for you. I think I'm going to put the temperature here. Yeah. I'll speak rapidly to try to be as brief as I can. My name is Jerry Bergman, as you know. I was born in Manhattan, and then after we lived in 70 Riverside Drive for the past 18 years. Thank you, Chair Samer, board members, and staff for this opportunity to briefly speak about hearing loss and more specifically the need for accessibility for people with hearing loss in our community. Johns Hopkins research says 48 million Americans have some degree of measurable loss. One in every three people, 65 to 74, one of three have hearing loss. It's the number one service-related disability among returning combat veterans. Yet only one in five people use hearing aids. Lack of public awareness and acceptance is a big reason why. I don't appear disabled, yet without assistive technology, I cannot hear in many places of public accommodation. I'm able to follow tonight's proceeding only because I requested accessibility and a card provider was given to me at city expense. Last year, thanks to Council Member Rosenthal's leadership, the City Council passed and Mayor de Blasio signed Local Law 51. It requires all new construction and renovations funded with $950,000 or more from the city and hearing loops installed in public meeting spaces and at the information and security desks. If this room had a hearing loop, the city would not have to pay the expense of a card operator each time one of us sought to attend. We would not have to request accessibility in advance. Most important, most of us could attend without needing anything other than the telecoils in our hearing devices, so no one would know of our difference. Many would be spared embarrassment due to the stigma of being hard of hearing. Over 200 public venues in 35 states, by my informal count, have installed hearing loops. Why not in this very room? The two main stages of Lincoln Center Theater now have hearing loops. Why not at the Met Opera? Why not at the other concert halls of Lincoln Center? Along with these remarks, I'm providing a short bio on my background and training in hearing access and advocacy, plus three lists. Uh, the Upper West Side accommodations, 10 that have installed groups, 29 others that have not, and my list of 202 venues in 35 states that also have installed groups. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask everybody else to stay with them for one minute. Our next speaker is Bill Rauch, followed by Ken. <laughs> um, along with uh, Cleo Davis, is going to talk to you about two hour Amsterdam. We are moving forward with a uh, lawsuit on that particular issue after a terrible BSA ruling and a very convoluted one. Um, our attorney Richard Emery speak on the 12th. Cleo will say more about that. Um, now it's time for everyone's least favorite topic of conversation, the American Museum of Natural History's Killer Center Project. Um, today was our day in court. The very uh, straight, very straightforward land use issue. We remind ourselves that they have claimed that the entire block from sidewalk to sidewalk, curb to curb, is theirs to do with as they please. And they say it was set aside. So all we are asking is that they go through the proper process as enshrined by the law. And I've done everything I can to turn the temperature way down 
that fight so we don't have our right people. It's inappropriate, obviously, for people coming here and blame you. You just look at the facts as they have. But now it's a matter of law, so I encourage elected officials, people in general, to you know come back into that because we really want to save those trees and we're going to win a judgment in the courts and there's going to have to eventually come to some sort of resolution. So you know, pay attention, maybe you know, kind of walk back into that thing because in the long term, we want to have a process if, you know, if they want to build more buildings in the park and you know, just better to do whatever they want with the entire park is not appropriate. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to say is going to be obvious to you because you live in the neighborhood, but what you may not know is that the Department of Transportation has a proposal for bringing the horse and carriages, which have changed their name now, their horse tags, up from Central Park South, which is bad for the horses because they're in traffic, up to the park. Our beloved Central Park, which has now gotten rid of cars, so instead we're getting horses. And they want to enter on uh, Tavern on the Green, which is not a bad idea because that's a big parking lot. But they also want to come to West 72nd Street. And as you all know, that is already the most heavily used entrance to the park. It is an absolutely insane idea. Tomorrow there is a public hearing, which nobody knew about. I only know about it because Roberta with whom I had spoken about this stupid plan, uh, sent me the notice, but there was no publicity for that whatsoever. Um, and a bunch of us are going down to protest. Um, it's dangerous because the, the horses have been asked to, to be on that roadway that used to be with cars, but they don't stay there. I live across the street and I've been watching. Uh, and they're coming up right to Central Park West, where, as you know, there are tour buses, there are strawberry fields, hundreds of people, plus every single time there's an event, that seems to be the entrance of choice. There were thousands there. <laughs> Boy, is that a minute already? Mm -hmm. Okay, can I just say one, one thing about the bike? There's also a thought of adding a bike route to Central Park West. And I, suggest, I know that's coming up later in your agenda. And can you just talk about bike riders riding in the park? We'll send on yeah. Thank you.
we recommend coming to the transportation yeah, committee meeting exactly. which will be next Tuesday and, and you can have your questions next here. Thank you. Good we'll evening. Followed everyone. by Shane Miller. What? Okay, good. Okay, so um, real quick, Peter Arnson from West Amsterdam, Midward North of 96th Street. And one of the things that I wanted to highlight is on the back table, there is a flyer for Architects of Bloomingdale. This is one of the talks, um, who walks and talks with the Bloomingdale Network History Group. It will be on October 16th at our great um, New York City Hostel on West 103rd Street. There will also be the first um, Jim Terrain, who is a local historian um, and member of our community, um, award being given to Peter Solomon for his uh, lifelong work on um, the Upper West Side history. You can find that in our events calendar along with a whole variety of other things, um, including Halloween stuff and um, blessing of the animals types, types of things. And while you're up there, grab our restaurant guide and find lots of good restaurants in our great neighborhood. Oh, and I'll quickly say that DOT has whipped up Columbus Avenue, much to my disgust, and it needs to be addressed. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is James Miller. I'll be uh, quick here, and, and uh, I'm a bicycle advocate. Uh, I applaud the uh, uh, Community 7 uh, uh, as uh, putting in the uh, bike lanes. It's helpful, uh, but there's a lot more to go for our safety. Uh, Riverside Drive could use a bike lane. I know a lot of bicyclists head up to the GWB, and it's very necessary to put bike lanes in there. You have pedestrian lanes and you have car lanes. We need bike lanes. Same thing over here on uh, 62nd Street and 59th Street, east to west. Those are huge lanes, and we can have bicycle bicycle lanes painted in there. It would be a no-brainer for the DOT to do such a thing, and we can all effectively get those bike lanes going east to west. It would be very helpful. One other thing. We got sirens. I don't know if there's hospital uh, representative here. But the sirens are excruciating. We're loud, getting much louder. We have noise issues. We have people that are having, you know, uh, I'm trying to be proactive uh, on hearing. It is hearing loss. It's up to all of us to uh, stop this uh, this uh, uh, noise pollution and uh, start to address it as much as possible. Our, our district manager, uh, Jay Ryan, who's unfortunately not here tonight, is scheduled a meeting with the hospital to talk with us. So, our next speaker is Bonnie Roach, followed by Lynn Sitmar, and followed by. Hello, my name is Bonnie Roach. I've been in the neighborhood for about five years. I was a long standing member on Community Board 5 for many, many years. I'm an architect and I'm concerned with three issues. Regarding Larry Silverstein's development on the entire ABC site, living at 1 West 67th Street, personally. The first is a short term issue, but um, I have received, and I do not know how to receive, nor do any of us know how to receive, any information on what appears to be a 28 drug generator sitting in front of ABC Studios that, when it has been tested, it makes living in or on that very narrow block, almost impossible to be in one's apartment. Secondly, um, I'd like to know how to find out continuously the recent activity in scope and scheduling of Silverstein's development. Thank you very much. We are now honored to be uh, have our Congressman Jerry Mather with us. So I'm going to ask him to come. Come and say a few words. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, before I say anything else, let me just uh, mention that uh, I'll be holding a town hall meeting next Tuesday at six o'clock at Borough of Manhattan Community College at 199. Uh, is it 199 Chamber Street? In case anybody's interested. Uh, I'll also be, you know, the every week, or I don't know that every week, every so often, uh, the president gives an address on uh, Saturday and the other party gets a chance to respond, although it's not really responding since we taped it before the president talks, but I'll be delivering a Democratic response 
uh, this week. Uh, let me just mention a couple of things uh, that are going on in Washington. Uh, the House is adjourned or recessed now till after, till after the election. We were supposed to be in session this week and next week. Uh, the House calendar they put out every January says so, but uh, the Republican leaders wanted their members home campaigning, and so they decided we had nothing to do this week and next week. The Senate, unfortunately, is still in session, and you know what they're doing. Um, and we'll see what they do uh, with Kavanaugh over the next few days. Let me just comment briefly. Uh, I'm not going to comment on, on, on the main uh, allegations against him from 35 years ago, um, which are very believable, obviously. But I have never seen a judge, a sitting judge, a sitting circuit court judge, come in with a partisan rant the way he did at the at the uh, at the uh, uh, hearing the other day to say that uh, the allegations against him or considerations a result of the Democratic Party plot because they're upset about the uh, uh, about Trump winning and many ways the revenge of the Clintons. Uh, that's if you're running for the Senate, you can say that. You're running for the House, you can say that. A judge who, whether he stays in the current court or God forbid goes to the Supreme Court, is going to have in front of him litigants who may include Democrats, half the country are Democrats, half the Republicans, roughly. And uh, he has just said he will have to recuse himself from those things. He's just said he will, he can't, he, he, has, he has shown such a resentment, justified or otherwise is beside the point, he has shown just such a resentment at Democrats generally that how can he be expected to sit uh, dispassionately on a case which may involve whether it's reapportionment or voter suppression or anything in which Democrats as a group have an interest? And I've never seen a judge do that like that. And that by itself should disqualify him on the spot. Having said that, and then maybe he'd make a fine candidate for U.S. Senate seat, but to be a judge, uh, even if he believes sincerely that he is being unfairly attacked and his, and his character unfairly maligned, it does not justify that kind of a, a speech from a, from a sitting judge who wants to be a higher court judge. Period. He disqualifies him as a judge. I hope the Senate will act that way. And now, of course, we've got evidence. I see how thorough the, the FBI investigations is meant to be. And now the newest thing, of course, is that um, uh, the uh, New York Magazine had various uh, charges in the New York, not New York Magazine, New Yorker, and, uh, and uh, he was asked at the hearing, when did he first learn of these charges? Well, he saw the New Yorker, so he said, except we now know that he and others around him were sending out text messages months ago how to deal with these, which means he deliberately perjured himself to the committee, which also was disqualified. Having said that, I want to switch subjects for one moment. Um, we face, uh, in many different ways, uh, a real challenge to the Democratic order. Have a, a, a president who uh, uh, attacks the judiciary, attacks the free press, it's the enemy of the people, a nice old Stalinist phrase, if you hadn't heard since Stalin, attacks the free press, attacks the judiciary, uh, seeks to uh, uh, pressure the FBI only to do what he wants it to do, subverts the Justice Department, subverts the institutions which we depend on for, for maintaining the democratic order. That's a real uh, challenge, and it was always anticipated by the framers of the Constitution that you might someday get a president or other civil officer who would violate democratic norms and do other things, and that's why we have a system of checks and balances. The Congress is supposed to check the executive and vice versa and so forth, but the current Congress has absolutely refused its constitutional duty to act as a check and a balance. It's absolutely refused to hold hearings to hold the administration accountable. Whether it's to hold hearings and say, how could you separate children from parents at the border? How could you separate them without even knowing, without keeping proper records so you can reunify them? Uh, how, how can you do a million different things? We're not holding the hearings. We're not holding the administration accountable. That's a terrible failure of Congress, and it's a very dangerous failure of Congress. And it's something that, uh, if partisan control should change hands, will change very rapidly. In fact, that was used more than you sort of, sort of encouraged to see that uh, you may have read this in the newspaper. Some uh, Republican circulated a memo uh, to Republican donors and said, we have to make sure we capture the House because if the Democrats capture the House, here's the list. Look at all these investigations they will hold. And I was amused at that because I looked at the list. There were almost 100 of them. And that list was put together essentially 
by taking the letters that my predecessor as, as ranking Democrat on the Judiciary Committee, John Conyers, and I have written to the Chairman of the Judiciary Committee over the last 18 or 19 months, and taking the letters that, uh, which were doing, you know, those letters said we ought to hold a hearing on this, we ought to hold a hearing on that, and the letters that the ranking Democrat uh, uh, Cummings from Maryland on the Investigations Committee had sent to the Chairman there, there was, uh, letters that Adam Schiff had sent to the Chairman of the Intel Committee, all of them saying we really hold the, ought to hold a hearing on this, we ought to be looking for that. All those letters were ignored. And what that Republican did, I forget his name, is simply take those letters, put them on one list, and say, my God, look at what the Democrats will do. Well, he's right. We, we won't do all of that. It's good about that many investigations. But we will, uh, if given the opportunity, vindicate the role of Congress in acting as a check and balance on the executive. It's very important for the constitutional order. Uh, and by the way, in the history of the country, obviously parties make a difference. Obviously, uh, investigations have been less um, energetic, shall we say, when Congress and the president were, the, were in the same hand, in the hands of the same party, Democrats or Republicans. Nonetheless, until now, you always had investigations and hearings, even if the presidency was controlled by the same party. There wasn't the total abdication of the constitutional responsibility, which there has been in the last two years. So that is something that we are determined, I am determined, if, if we, if the Democrats take control, I'll be the chairman of the Judiciary Committee and all I can, I am determined, a lot of other people are determined, we will change that because it's important uh, to hold any administration, I would say, in my bias to you, this administration in particular, but certainly any administration, accountable, make them justify what they're doing, or make them change what they're doing if they can't justify it, and be a check and a balance on the administration. So uh, I shouldn't talk too long, but that's so, some of what is going on now. Uh, there's a pent up demand in much of the country to, to oh, one other thing. The, the emoluments lawsuit. Let me mention this. There's a provision in the Constitution that says, the pre, that says nobody enjoying a position of honor and profit under the United States, any, any civil officer from the president to the postmaster, may take any amount, any gifts, et cetera, et cetera, or emolument from any foreign power without the consent of Congress. So when George Washington was, was given a gift by the Sultan of someplace of a horse, he went to Congress and said, what should I do with the horse? And Congress said, well, I feel what they said. And Thomas Jefferson was given the, uh, by a different Sultan, was given a sword, a ceremonial sword. He went to Congress and they said, put it in the Smithsonian. Okay. You cannot accept an emolument without getting the condition, the, uh, the, the approval of Congress first. It's never been a big issue in American history, not since Thomas Jefferson saw it. And it was never a problem until now. Because President Bush has not divested himself of his interest in very far flung business in Iraq. Oh, President Bush. Well, he's better. Not <laughs> President Trump has never divested his interest. And so anytime the Saudi Arabian delegation to uh, to whatever stays in a Trump hotel, that's money into the pocket of the president, even if they pay fair market rates. And when the Chinese government gives a copyright uh, to a Trump organization, that's money into the pocket of the president, and so forth, and everything. Um, the Emoluments Clause is intended to assure, it's the main anti-corruption clause in the Constitution. It's intended to assure that the loyalty of the president of the United States and of any other civil officer is to the United States and not to his pocketbook. And, and it isn't in his mind, gee, if I do this, maybe the Saudis will, will send people to my hotel. Well, the president has been doing this, not asked Congress for permission at all. So Senator Blumenthal of Connecticut and I, joined by 200 other Democratic members of Congress, brought a lawsuit against the president to say he can't do this. He must come to Congress first. Uh, they challenged our right to bring that lawsuit. They challenged the standing of members of Congress and standing before the court. Last Friday, the court ruled that we had standing. It's the biggest, right. um, <laughs> the biggest roadblock. And uh, so we're, that lawsuit is going to proceed. The next step is to get over another point about a motion to dismiss. Then we'll go into discovery. And among the discovery things, I'm sure we'll ask to see the tax returns to see yeah. I'm sure they'll, they'll get that. Oh, by the way, one other thing. There's a 1924 law 
passed in the aftermath of the Teapot Dome scandal, which I'm sure everybody remembers, a big scandal under President Harding. As a result, Congress passed a law that said the Ways and Means Committee of the House, the Finance Committee of the Senate, and the Joint Economic Committee can see anybody's tax returns upon request. Now, Democrats have asked to find the Ways and Means Committee to request the present tax returns, and the party line vote that said no, but if that party line control should change, even without the emoluments lawsuits, those tax returns will, will be shown. In any event, I, I want to make one other announcement. I have a new community representative, uh, Hannah uh, Wienerman, who's in the back there. She'll be uh, attending these meetings on my behalf in Washington, and uh, she'll do a great job, I'm sure. And uh, thank you very much. Residents being arrested. Okay. Residents. And the originally the, uh, the decision to sell the building was denied by Eric Scheinman. And it was approved. They are not complying with the agreement from the court. The argument has. Okay. Let me, let me just say we will do everything we can to help. Just talk to Hannah or yes. Selena or someone in my office who will do what we can to help. That was the old Salvation Army. Yes, yeah. it's our Okay. And if, I would just like to add, I'm there, and I could threaten not to be there in writing. Yes, very well, serious. Show that to our office, and we'll, we'll, we'll see what we'll, we'll, we'll we can. I would appreciate your involvement. Okay, we will we'll, we'll get involved. Thank you. Okay. But you got to come to us. Thank you. This is going to yeah. seem not so important considering the issues that you brought up, but. Amtrak is actually being destroyed by its current chief, Richard Anderson, from Delta Airlines. He is looking to make trains that are daily, fly weekly, so you have to consult a calendar. He has removed amenities like fresh cooked meals. There are boxes now. He has removed personnel from stations in the middle of the country. Um, and of course, you know the status of Gateway and what, what should happen if that isn't done. If that isn't done. So, is there anything to be done about Richard Anderson? Well, the Federal government has kept Amtrak on starvation uh, budgets for, for years. We've tried to change that. Uh, I'm not terribly familiar with Anderson, but we can look into that and uh, try to push. I, I, everything depends on who is controlling Congress, obviously. We will try to certainly, um, we will try to push to, to restore Amtrak. I mean, I've noticed that even on the Acela, there's deferred maintenance and it's uh, it's, it's getting not nearly as reliable as it was. Congress right. passed recently to record amount of money for Amtrak, but spe specified it must be a national system, and he wants to make it just a northeastern system. Basically. Well, we are opposed to that. We did, you know, in the act in 2015, I think it was, we enabled for the first time the Northeast Corridor, which is the only profit making part of Amtrak, we enabled uh, Amtrak to keep the money to it, the, the profit in effect. Uh, to reinvest it in the Northeast Corridor. Um, it's usually the Western senators who have insisted that we keep it a national system and we want them to. Uh, but we also want to make sure the Northeast Corridor is not uh, just milked. We did that, or we gave them the ability to do that, I should say, in the, in the 2015 last major transportation bill. But we'll, 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 I'm glad you brought that to my attention. Thank you. Um, it's great that you're, you're proceeding with the emoluments plus uh, litigation, if for no other reason it takes it out of the realm of just being a bar exam question. The, um, uh, but the next step is, is a curiosity to me. I, I welcome your views. What do we get if we win? <laughs> well, we're going to have to figure out, what, you know, if we win the lawsuit, um, I think what we'll get is an order that he must divest all his interests. He must, because otherwise everything is a violation of the emoluments. The moment he became president, one minute later, he was in violation of the emoluments clause, and he said that in advance. So I think what we'll get is an order uh, to divest all those, and, 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 and probably, hopefully, in order for an accounting, how much he must give back to the Treasury 
that he's taken from foreign governments. Is that a high crime when it's It's a well, debatable. It's certainly a violation of his constitutional duty, uh, but on the other hand, there's no pre precedent um, decision. It'd be hard to maintain that that was. I mean, if, if you're going to impeach the president, frankly, if you're going to impeach the president, you're going to do it on on on, on much worse grounds than that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank you so much. 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 Thank speak very briefly. Then we'll go back to Thank Well, you know, you never know how things are going to work out. When I was in high school, uh, Jerry and I were on the debating team together, and he was constantly running for office in student government. <laughs> and every time he ran, which was many times, I did all his campaign posters, and he kept winning by larger and larger margins every time he ran. So here we are. <laughs> uh, so um, a few things. Uh, one is I'm very happy that uh, the, the speed cameras uh, around many of our schools uh, got turned back on, uh, despite the efforts of, uh, of the Republicans in the state Senate. Uh, you know, the governor declared a state of emergency, which enables him to uh, override statutory provisions, and he overrode the provision in the state law allowing these cameras to enforce traffic laws, he overrode the clause that sunsets uh, that law uh, at least for, I guess, 30 days in a shot. So uh, you won't have to be doing these executive orders every so often. Um, we, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago, had a uh, uh, rally demonstration uh, out on Central Park West. Uh, supporting Community Board 7's Transportation Committee's resolution calling for a uh, protected bike lane um, on Central Park West. <laughs> uh, two one going each way. Um, on the 700 plus uh, foot high building that is being proposed on West 66th Street, uh, I and other elected officials and Landmark West and uh, 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 the Committee for Environmentally Sound Development and others uh, have filed a legal challenge uh, on uh, zoning grounds uh, to that development, and hopefully we will succeed. Uh, last thing I want to mention is there are going to be three propositions uh, on the ballot uh, in New York City this November. Uh, two of them, uh, numbers two and three, I think severely endanger uh, the viability of our community boards. And uh, on the table in the rear, there is a, a flyer talking about uh, what's wrong with propositions two and three. I've been uh, actively involved with our President Gail Brewer uh, in the campaign uh, that we are building uh, to try to defeat those two propositions. So I would urge you all to pick up a copy of the flyer. That's it. Okay. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, next is Wayne. I'm Wayne Armstrong. Um, and I want to talk about the op I want to talk about the opportunity for the community board and the community to deal with lead. <clears throat> As you probably know, Scott Springer has started a series of hearings on lead. This one was co-sponsored by our, our many of our uh, political representatives, plus community boards nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. There, <clears throat> Uh, there were a couple of us that testified as individuals from, from the Community Board 7 area. Madeline and I were both there uh, and testified. 
I pointed out the dangers that we can not only help cure, which the emphasis was largely on NYCHA and existing land problems with paint and other things, and also the fact that HPD environment and health the city agencies do not cooperate to solve the problem. That came up again and again. Um, and <laughs> we have a lot of the NYCHA area buildings in this area. Then uh, that was September 17th. <laughs> I pointed out the opportunity that we have to prevent further lead things with and using the evidence from that we had put together around PS Public School 163 on 97th Street with the proposed construction of the Jewish home. Then on September 27th, as you probably know, the city council had, had a hearing uh, with three committees, Mark Levine, Health, um, the Environmental Protection and HP and Buildings, all testified as did parks, water, and other people. Uh, there were 25 bills proposed on lead, very few of which dealt with ambient air lead, which which is again for PS 163 the issue. Um, we're, we're considering, there is in consideration developing either state or city legislation on lead. And, and I hope that the appropriate group committees of this um, community board will participate. I have the proposed EPA legislation, which isn't going to, which we're not going to deal with for at least a year. Uh, and the other testimony from the PS 163 on environment, which I'd be glad, which I think you have, but we can see now. Well, we'll send that to the Parks and Environment Committee. I'd like to call on Captain Mellon from the 20th Precinct. Well, this is good for the, uh, for the second straight month. They can actually deliver uh, good news when it comes to crime. I got here on. April 9th, at that point, the uh, precinct was up in crime for the year that would be January 1st, April 9th. The precinct was up in seven major crime, 14.9%. Uh, we're still up in crime right now as of Monday, but it's 1.9%. Um, we're down 7% to 28-day period. Again, we had a really, really great summer uh, in the 28-day period. Um, the only thing we were upping was GLAs. I spoke about that last time. Scooters were almost almost an issue. Um, very good news. We're all over the, uh, speaking of news, we're all over the local news tonight. I don't know if anybody uh, saw it. Um, this, is, uh, this is really, really cool for those who haven't seen it. Uh, yesterday at noon in Brooklyn, there was a delivery man. He was driving a delivery van, delivering like uh, non, -pharmaceutical, non pharmaceutical medical supplies, like uh, diapers, formula, things like that. Um, and he was just parking this delivery van and he tapped into a parked car. Out of nowhere, he was approached by two individuals who said, hey, we know the owner of that car, you gotta pay us money, uh, we want $1,000. <laughs> the delivery guy called his boss, his boss said, uh, no, don't pay it, call the police and uh, let's go through insurance. Uh, and then the uh, two perpetrators said, uh, yeah, no you don't. And they produced a firearm, uh, threw him in their car, kidnapped him, and then they, uh, they drove him to Queens, one was driving, one of them had the guy at uh, gunpoint while driving the car. The other one took his delivery van, drove to Queens. They stashed the uh, delivery van near one of the perpetrators' homes. Uh, then the, uh, the two perpetrators jumped in the car with the poor delivery guy, um, got on the phone again with the supervisor and said, uh, you know, pay us or you're, we're prepared to use our gun um, and you're not gonna get your driver or your van back. And the boss said, all right, all places. He says, okay, meet me at 7-3 in Broadway. Um, here in the Upper West Side. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, he just picked that kind of out of a hat, I guess, because there's a bank nearby. The, reasons. Um, the uh, owner was smart enough to call 911. Uh, the, uh, I had uh, a really sharp sergeant, a couple of patrol cops yesterday who uh, met him over on 73 in Broadway. They, uh, they set a trap. They just waited, and sure enough, the white BMW pulls up. Um, the officers uh, move in they, after the cash exchange. Uh, they chase one perpetrator uh, on the street. They capture him pretty quickly. The other guy goes uh, down 71st Street toward West End from Broadway through a school there. The school was on lockdown. 
recently, thankfully, they were great. Nobody was hurt. Um, through an alleyway, up, uh, eight floors of fire escape, the cop who was chasing him was in much better shape than me. <laughs> <laughs> thankfully, uh, and I uh, got him on the eighth floor fire escape and had uh, him in a cop from emergency services uh, arrest without a perpetrator, without a police officer, without a civilian. Are actually hurt. So this is really good. The perpetrators are facing robbery, kidnapping, extortion. I don't think there's a crime with penal law that they're not charged with. Right now. <laughs> That's on the law side. So it was uh, really just fine by patrol officers, uh, Officer McCaffrey and uh, Sergeant Paul, who was on the fire escape. I encourage everybody here to take a look at our Twitter feed and now our Facebook page. Um, you can see photos of the firearm recovered, the fire escape, the officers involved. Um, it was. Uh, you know, I, I, this is something that uh, listen, I spent a lot of time in South Bronx, uh, and I saw a lot of violent crime. Um, I don't think I've ever seen a kidnapping across his boroughs in 18 and a half years. Um, you don't think this kind of thing is going to touch the Upper West Side. I never would have expected it, but sure enough, there we were. Um, I'm just proud, I'm proud of my cops. They were ready. They were ready to go. Uh, and they did very, very well. <laughs> I see that's the NCOs this week in the crime team. One thing I have going on is I have a burglary pattern on the midnights. Uh, we have a guy who's going right through the, right through the front door of Century 21 uh, about uh, three and a half weeks ago. Uh, he then went right through the front door of Chico's. This is happening between like 3 and 5 a.m. Then he hit Equinox twice. Uh, it's smash and grab. Um, so all of my uh, extra resources and NCOs and plenty of those people right now are deployed on midnights. Uh, we're trying to get this guy. Um, two pieces of like concerning news. One is just kind of bad news for those people who've been working with them. So um, if everyone's familiar with the NCOs, you can find them. You can just Google Twenty Precincts or a web page that they are. I'm losing two of them. Uh, Joe Finnerty from Sector Adam. Uh, Chris, I know you've worked uh, close with him. Smart guy. Going up to uh, Orange County for a higher paying police job. And then in uh, Sector Boy, Kevin Katie, Rockland County for a uh, Again, like this is the time of local police departments hire. Um, we're going to have two interview replacements right now, and we'll choose two very soon candidates. Tough loss. Tough loss for good people. Second thing that I'm really hurting with right now, and when it comes to staff and the school crossing guards, so I'm down uh, three, uh, I have three vacancies plus just one who's going out long term sick. Um, here's the deal with school crossing guards uh, it doesn't pay very, very well. It pays like between thirteen and fifteen dollars an hour, but you but it comes with health benefits. If I could ask the community board for help, is especially if you're on Twitter, um, you don't have to live in the 20th precinct to be a school crossing guard in the 20th precinct. Uh, we have these vacancies. Applying is simple. It's done online. If they can pass the word, if they know anyone and anywhere they go, if there's any meetings, the, and I'm not the only precinct. Um, but I'm very worried, particularly with a couple of problematic intersections. I don't have a lot of uniform manpower to cover, so. That's why I asked. I don't know what kind of question. Yeah. Where, do they, where, do yeah. where do they? How do they apply? Just go to just the NYP website, uh -huh. and there's a link there to apply for school crossing guards. And you just Google NYP school crossing guards. One of the first results that comes up. Great. I'll, I'll tweet. Yes. Yeah. Seven. Yeah. And if you look at my Twitter feed, I've got a, like, over the past. I'm tweeting twice a week that we need uh, that we have vacancies and we need uh, we need help. Okay. Uh, at NYP tool precinct. We'll get it out. Yeah. We'll put it on our website. Thank you. 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 Thank
Uh, feel free to ask me questions. I'll be here for a bit, but you can go online to my website to make suggestions. And uh, everything is going actually really well at the council. I think we're moving forward in incredibly uh, responsive ways when it has to do with lead. Um, in housing, uh, we're about to have an amazing uh, additional hearing with housing and buildings, um, introducing legislation with even more protections for rent regulated tenants. If you're interested in that, let me know. Um, and the Committee on Women is about to make some great strides forward as it has to do with the disparity in maternal um, mortality and morbidity rates between black and white women, as well as how the NYPD um, uh, um, deals with survivors of uh, sexual assault. Um, we're going to have a big hearing next month is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month, and we're going to have a big hearing with the new Office of Office to End, um, it used to be OCDB, the Office to Combat Domestic <laughs> Violence. It's now the Office to End Gender Based Violence. NGBV. <laughs> um, anyone have any questions about what's going on in the neighborhood? No, we have a hearing tomorrow. There's a hearing tomorrow on horses. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a hearing tomorrow. <laughs> um, it's at 1 o'clock at 55 Water Street, if it wasn't already announced. It's the proposal by the DOT to bring horses into the park at some into the park at West 72nd and CPW. I encourage people to if they're going to make comments if they're attending that hearing please uh copy me on your comments i'm really going to want to hear what my constituents have to say about this um i haven't gotten much feedback at all from anyone we didn't have a speaker. except for um well, so I'm interested to in hear about the speaker. I apologize for not being here, but I've gotten a lot of positive feedback from those in the uh, animal rights community. Um, with one consideration, which has to do with shape um, at that location. Anything else? Bicycle safety. Um, Bike lanes. Anything going on? Well, I mean, most importantly, I call for a protected two-way bike lane the Department of Tra on Central Park West. Um, and it's my understanding that the Department of Transportation, unless you've heard otherwise, is preparing a presentation for this community board. I don't have a sense of timing. Be happy to double check on that. Have they reached out to you? I mean, we're going to vote on that. Yeah. Oh. They're weighing the options. They're going to come back with a proposal in January. We have a resolution on If that. I can help with anything else, just <laughs> ask the community board. <laughs> we have the best community board here. Mark and then Polly. Okay. So we're going to the governor of California has proposed using the power of his pension fund to insist that women be appointed to corporate boards. Um, I don't think we can stop at one, but at least it's a start. Um, can we do the same thing and how do we get there from here? Great question. Um, it's, I think it's LA County, if, if, but it could be for all of California, I'm not sure. But um, it would be to the pension boards or all private boards? It would be corporate boards, but the pension fund would be the mover because they have to listen to their shareholders. Right. So there are two ways, the, probably the way to do that. There are several ways shareholder activism can happen. Um, and one of the things I'm learning is every locality is very, very different. So what they can do in California is probably very different than what they can do in New York State compared to what we can do in New York City. Um, 
but I'll look into that more. I actually have heard about it and have started researching on it. You know, I'm hearing conflicting information. There are studies that show that having more women in diversity on corporate boards and in top management gets better results for the company, but there are those who say uh, that may not be true. So something worth investigating for sure, and I appreciate it. Mark. One last question. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've noticed on Columbus Avenue that the street has been ripped up with yeah. grids, and it's pretty dangerous navigating it. Is there a way for the Department of Transportation maybe to put some kind of plastic walkway? Because the grids are so bad that I've seen people falling, you know, when the car yeah, yeah. So it's so, been a challenge to walk yeah, down for the last couple of weeks. Um, I'm yeah, aware, I'm back yeah, you forget it if you're a biker. Right. Um, so what happened is there's a, been a lot of con Edison work being done. So what they ended up doing, Department of Transportation therefore decided to remill and repave the entire street from I think 108 and I think it's supposed to begin next week, the okay. repayment. Right, but I was thinking like in the future that has to happen, if they could put some kind of plastic across the walkways so that people can navigate across who have wheelchairs and walkers, etc. because it's dangerous. I think that's great. I think that'd be a great thing to bring through the committee. And um, I certainly empathize. Well, thank you guys all very much. Great to see you. So we can end today. This is working out really well. We're going to have our uh, electric rep speak. So first up is Jennifer Greer from Public Advocate to James Office, followed by Eric Pella from from uh, Representative Mark. Um, good evening, everyone. I just wanted to bring it back. This is Jennifer from the Public Advocates Office. I um, just wanted to bring it back to the city charter. Um, as you probably know, there was a meeting last week at City Hall to garner information in order to provide input for next year's City Charter Commission. If you were unable to make that meeting and you would like to submit testimony as soon as possible, you can do so online. Um, the website is charter2019.nyc. Um, and there's no hard deadline yet, but I do encourage everyone to put it in as early as possible. Um, and as always, I'm going to leave my cards in the back, so if you need to flag any information or you have any questions for me, feel free to leave. Yeah. Okay. 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 Hello, everyone. My name is Eric Leo. I'm from the Office of Council Member Mark Levine. Just wanted to make a few quick announcements. Um, mm -hmm. First, the Council Member has introduced an expansion of Rights of Council. Um, so we are hoping that uh, this will be heard quickly through committee. Um, it expands the um, income requirement. Um, as of right now, somebody with a minimum wage as a single household cannot get legal representation through rights of counsel. We want to change that. We want to make sure that everyone has that access. Um, and we are also holding up for a uh, rollout of new zip codes that will be given access to rights of counsel. We have participatory budgeting, as the council member mentioned. Um, we have our assembly, where we'll be gathering ideas on capital projects in the neighborhood. That will be on Thursday, October 11th, at Bloomingdale Library, from 6 to 8. We encourage everyone to please come by and give us your ideas and your thoughts. And finally, um, we are finalizing a transportation town hall, so a number of the concerns that have been brought up here should definitely be brought there as well. That will be on Monday, October 15th, and that will be at the Manhattan School of Music, which is at 120 Claremont Avenue. That's uh, roughly about 120th and Riverside Drive. Um, we will have members of transportation alternatives and um, other representatives in the transportation field to take on a host of questions, whether it's transit signal priority or anything else that um, you would like to bring to our attention. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Daisy. I'm from Senator Serrano's office. Um, in the back, I have our October community report, which came out today. 
And more importantly, on Thursday, October 11th, we're having an emergency preparedness training at the JASA Community Center. And so the link to register is on the flyer, but if you come up to me with your name and uh, contact information, I can also sign you up. Um, so starting October 5th, um, our office is entering into a communication blackout due to the elections. But if you contact our office, we can still help with constituent concerns, issues, uh, whether or not you choose to vote for the Senator, where our office is still open to help constituents. Thank you. Thank you so much. Hi, my name is Stephanie Gazell. I'm uh, State Senator Brown Holmes and Chief of Staff. Um, we have our community board report in the back. I just want to highlight a few things. Uh, November 3rd, we'll be having a free flu shot event at our offices. Uh, we're going to get a rally in favor of saving the boys club in the East Village. Um, as my parents might know, state test scores were very limited this year. Caused a lot of problems. We wrote a letter to DOE, and uh, that week they released their scores. Um, and finally, I just want to highlight um, two last things. One uh, did an op-ed with Alec Baldwin and Blake Danner talking to the MTA about electric buses. A lot of people raise bus idling and environmental concerns. Um, so that is a big concern of our office. And lastly, we met with the uh, Community Coalition to Save Life Israel, and um, we're going to be writing a letter to the governor and supporting a bill that uh, requires local community input before hospital closure. I also just wanted to say in response to the um, board's um, comment and also the policy director currently um, if you have ideas for uh, state legislation please feel free to reach out you can email direct me directly at stephanie at bradhoylman.com um, also um, any constituent concerns you have please call our office um, we'd love to, to be involved to help out um, oftentimes it may seem like a city issue but if a state official comes in you can really put on that added pressure that's critically needed so Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Caitlin Larry from Southern Northern Roosevelt's office. And we have a few exciting events coming up. We also have a free food shot day on October 24th. Uh, we're having a free mammogram day on November 16th. And this Thursday, uh, the October 4th, we are organizing uh, well, not for office, but Linda is organizing a bus uh, down to DC to get us the Sabanau boat. And so, if you're interested in that, you can check out Linda's Facebook. Um, and as far as some exciting things that have uh, been going on, uh, the Assembly Rivers First in the Nation Emergency Event Info Packet Bill has been signed into law, which requires hospitals to provide patients with vital information um, regarding the bill. And uh, before this year's primary, the assembly member held a voter registration drive in the district. Um, we can see some volunteers uh, in the community board as well. And uh, so we're really happy with the high voter turnout. We're hoping that it all be even higher in the upcoming general election. Thanks. Next is Ms. Gail Dante from Gail Brewer's office. Hi, everyone. Um, I know that Gail already spoke. Oh, wow. Um, so I just wanted to bring up a couple things that she um, did not bring up, but community board recruitment time is close upon us. And so all of the applications for community boards will be available in our office at the end of November. So I really encourage everybody to knock on doors and to find your neighbors that are really interested and joining this illustrious crew of people um, to do as such. And typically every year, CB7 has the highest amount of applicants out of any community board, out of any borough. Um, and so that's really impressive to us. It means that we have a waiting list of some really amazing candidates. Um, but I've had an opportunity to speak with Roberta today about some of the needs of the board. And so we're really looking to um, have as robust and diverse representation from 
this neighborhood as possible. Um, and then just a bit of personal news. Um, as of October 19th, I will be leaving the borough president's office. Um, I've been with Gail for four years. It has been one of the highlights of my career. I moved from Philadelphia to take the job as director of community affairs. Um, and it just has absolutely changed my life. So first, I would really like to thank you all um, for informing my job and really helping me to learn um, the intricacies of the Upper West Side so deeply. Um, I am very moved by um, just the passion and commitment that I see from a lot of the community members on the Upper West Side. But rest assured, I am not going far. Um, I will be joining the government affairs team at the New York City Transportation for the subway. So I'm excited about that. They obviously have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, and I am looking forward to rolling up my sleeves and getting to work. But I just wanted to say thank you all. Yeah. We, we, we will be following you around because we will miss you. But it's been a pleasure to work with you. Um, and I know many, many of us have had the pleasure of going to some of the seminars and some of the programs. And, uh, so we have three minutes before we start our, you have something you want to say? Yeah. Go. Well, I guess Bill Wildenbush mentioned that we both belong, or he's saying, we both belong to both Cleo Day and the committees were aligned on sound development, as you all know. We have taken the lawsuit as a developer of two hundred. Amsterdam, two hundred Amsterdam that Gail alluded to, and Bill Rowdenbush uh, alluded to. We're both on the same committee, so that's the confusion. In any case, an update to the uh, board who have been extremely supportive of our efforts to stop the developers from putting up the standard. This is the tower on Amsterdam Avenue by gerrymandering these crazy zoning lots to West End Avenue. And we'd like you to know that we are about ready to file our lawsuit any day. It uh, is the New York State Supreme Court, which is a more independent venue than the city agencies that we have been dealing with up until now. And the other update is that the Municipal Art Society has joined us in this suit, which is impressive, and they will match dollar for dollar our uh, whatever money we raise just for the lawsuit. So we urge you to support us both by following us and by contributing to the fund. The lawsuit is about to happen. Okay, thank you. Well, that takes us to 30 seconds before our 8 o'clock deadline. So, if anyone has a quick question, it's 8 o'clock. Yeah, if you fill out a green form to speak during, during the yellow, during. The yellow forms we just went through. Did you fill it out to speak during the business meeting? Yes. So you're going to speak during the business meeting. Yeah. That, 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 what will happen is when the area that you're going to talk about, the committee chair will call on you to speak. Okay. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Hi, uh, tomorrow we're having a housing committee meeting and we're having a great speaker, um, a deputy director of independent budget office is going to talk about the many iterations of 421A. So it's tomorrow community board office at 7 p.m. What's 421A? 421A, 421A, it's not people that you know. 421A is a sort of controversial tax abatement program that was promoting development um, from back in the 70s until now, it's rebranded as Affordable New York. So it's kind of about how the program has evolved and what the controversy is. And I think it's been really interesting. Yeah, and he's a very good speaker. So we are now at the 8 o'clock mark.
I'm going to call on Josh, um, who is the chair of the um, elections committee. His committee members include Larry Newell, Cindy Cardinal, and Louise McCann. Thank you. Um, Clary and Louise are going to come around and hand out the ballots to everybody. Please initial next to your name that you have received the ballot. Uh, we want to make sure that we have a complete list of everybody that is here. I want to say thank you to everybody for a good turnout, also for um, the election tonight. So uh, before the meeting started, we drew randomly to see who was going to speak. Each candidate is going to get three minutes to speak. And for chair, the order is going to be Roberta first, Richard second, and Michelle third. Each candidate will get three minutes after everybody speaks. Anybody who has any questions will be able to ask questions of the candidates. When that's complete, the candidates for vice chair will get three minutes each to speak. We chose that in random order as well. Uh, they chose actually, everybody chose. We didn't go choose it. It's going to be Polly, then Audrey, then Amy, then Andrew. Three minutes each. And after everybody speaks, everybody will get to ask questions for the people running for vice chair. Yes. And then also running for secretary is Lolita and Sarah. They're, they're both running unopposed, but they will, you still will need to vote for them. So everybody, when you get a ballot in the first round, there are three people running for chair. You will vote for one person for chair. For vice chair, there are four people running for vice chair. You will vote for two. And there are two people running for secretary. You will vote for two. Please make sure that you also sign the ballot for round one at the bottom of the form. It's important that your signature is on the form. If you have any questions or you're not sure, please reach out to one of us and ask us so that uh, we can make sure this is done properly. Cindy is going to keep time for each candidate when they speak. At the two minute and 30 second mark, she's going to hold up the sign on the white side and say, this means you have 30 seconds to go. Then the red will come up and that will be the time. Thank you. Thank We're especially proud that 96th Street and West End Avenue, there finally are some safety improvements in place. Uh, we've been working to increase and improve affordable housing, including NYCHA. We've applied for a uh, urban planning fellow to work on uh, getting statistics about the affordable housing in our community, what we've lost, what we've gained, and what we're trying to maintain. We've worked to maintain diversity in our neighborhood and transparency. We continue constantly to improve communications. We've had three TV shows, one of which is up and running. The next one will be on soon. We've done the Twitter chats. 
We've uh, worked with localized the rag, the West Side Spirit. Uh, we've been working very hard with Paige and with some of the um, community groups to work on the super talls. I've been speaking out about this for two years. I've been working with all the other CDs on it. We've maintained ongoing relationships with Columbia, Fordham, American Museum of Natural History, Lincoln Center, Goddard Riverside, the Lighthouse Guild of the Line, Westside Federation of Seniors, Supportive Housing, Block Associations, Developers, the electeds, bids, the agencies. Um, we have several task force that have been, uh, NYCHA task force headed by Madeline has held four forums so far with community board nine, uh, been very successful. We're planning the fifth one on succession, which should be probably sometime in November, somehow October just got very, very busy. Uh, I mentioned the Broadway Task Force. We also have a Charter Revision Task Force, and they are um, going to be working for the next 18 months with uh, Gail Brewer and uh, the other CVs. Thank you so much. Hi, Richard. I want to take the opportunity to get when I get my uh, chair report to say uh, how honored I've been to be a member of the board for the time of memory, the time of the memory of man, and if not to the contrary. Uh, I, I, I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I've enjoyed working with uh, my mem co members. Highest quality, highest caliber of intelligence and expertise in their fields. And I particularly enjoy working uh, with non members who come here and uh, give their cases on various issues. Uh, I've gotten to a point in my career where I'm able for the first time to devote the kind of time that's necessary to be uh, a uh, chair of the board. Someone may ask in the question and answer session, why would somebody want a full time, non paying job? Everybody's always a carpenter. Now I know. Uh, and I may not even want that question, except for my love of this board and the work that we do. And as to the future, uh, I believe that uh, I have a, a fair amount of uh, ability and expertise in the issues of zoning, in particular, the two talls. I have uh, a history long, even predating my membership on the board, of working with educational institutions, founding a uh, K through eight school. I was chair of two uh, large uh, community organizations which dealt with after school uh, programs, and, and I'm still involved in all of those things. I worked uh, on a, on a uh, corporation that provided psychiatric outreach to the homeless. So uh, what, I've, what I've learned about land use, I've picked up being on the board, uh, but my community involvement goes way beyond that. Um, I, I'm, uh, I believe that another important issue that we need to address, and we need to do it proactively, is affordable housing. Uh, and I agree with uh, everybody what what the official was who said uh, it doesn't work to have dribs and drabs and 20 percent of this building and 10 percent of that building uh, which never actually get built in those buildings maybe built somewhere else uh, oh, that was a stop oh that was a conversation <laughs> sorry uh, i think that we have uh, we have to look very closely at public housing in our community we have two public housing projects my, uh, many of you know my style of conducting meetings. I think I do it fairly well. I've learned that skill on the board. Uh, my uh, hallmark, I think, is inclusiveness uh, and productivity. Thanks. Richard, all moms have 
Um, paying 24 hours. Yes. <laughs> Good evening, hello. Um, you may remember me from last year when I ran for a CB7 chair. Well, I'm back here, uh, smarter and, more, and better prepared than ever. But I have a lot of people to thank for that over, over this year. Uh, my mentors, my CB7 friends, my family, my committee, and the uh, CB7 office, John, Jesse, and you all answered my questions, guided me on personal and CB7 issues, pointed me in the right direction to find information, helped me develop myself as a leader. We had fun too. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everybody. <laughs> But I failed you last year, so I prepared harder for chair this year to do that. I attended borough board meetings. These are monthly meetings for all the CB7 chairs in the borough board's office, Gail's office, to exchange ideas and discuss issues. And when I had information from those meetings, I passed it on to my friends and my family. I asked the BCI committee, of which I'm co-chair, uh, I asked them to do more than what is required in their job description. And they agreed. Together, we attended an SLA board meeting on 125th Street this summer on an issue in our district. But we heard a lot more and learned a lot more that day. We heard presentations from Buffalo to Montour. Many towns do not have boards who hear SLA issues. And I'm really glad we're here in New York. And, and I'm really happy the way we handle them here. We also, the BCI committee also met in August to discuss enclosed cafe issues. And my presentation at full board in September was the start, let's say, of our discussion. Thank you, BCI members. You're really always there. We also have plans uh, outside the agenda for the future to win another business, a business networking session, an idea conceptualized and executed by myself and my former co-chair six years ago. <coughs> uh, I think PCI is successful in large part, well, we have great personalities, but in large part because uh, I don't keep information from them. As soon as I know it, they know it. They come to every meeting knowing if there's gonna be good or bad news. 30 seconds? Oh my God. I attended many committee meetings and task force meetings this year, <laughs> in part to see how you conduct your meetings and in part to ask questions about your committee issues. My apologies for those meetings I did to those who have uh, committees and task force who I did not attend. I had a hard time finding minutes. I listened to many C new CB7 members. I know it's tough to be a new member because um, you're appointed at I have to stop at the end of the year, and we need an orientation task force, tweak the bylaws, and a mentorship committee this year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now, if anybody has any questions for uh, any of the three candidates, uh, now is the time to speak. Josh, yes. one star, candidate, 44 ballots. 44 ballots. Anybody not have one? No, I didn't. Yeah. Everybody has it here. Um, I think yes. you can begin the beginning, so it took time away. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yes. 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 Uh, my question is from Michelle and Richard. Um, community board covers uh, from 110 degree to 66. I was, I'm sorry, to 59. I would, each of you, I would like you to tell me how you in, were. Uh, supportive or uh, at least interested in what's going on in public housing and what contributing factors have you given to the task force or any public housing matters on this board. I know everybody's joined this board for their own issues, but I, when I got to the board, I went to most committee meetings to see what the community board was about. I would like you to tell me what have you contributed to public housing um, 
Nothing, honestly. I have stuff to learn. I don't know what you mean by this Could you do that? Can I ask you a question? What happens if you have to be in support of what uh, public housing is going to be? What happens if you have to be in Well, I'm on the community board. I support issues on the community board. I want to say uh, that's a very apt comment. I will also uh, plead guilty, uh, but it is one of the things uh, I think we should be more proactive about. And it would be my aim to do that. I, I, the, the state, I know pretty well the state of public housing in the city because of my work in East Harlem County. And uh, it is dreadful. It, it is also an intractable problem. And I think we ought to devote more of our resources to trying to solve it. But thanks, thanks very much for asking that question. Thanks. And I just want to thank um, Madeline for your leadership on the task force. Um, for those of you who are new to the board, my name is Elizabeth Caputo. I chair the board, and I believe I'm the only person around the table of board members who served for three consecutive one-year terms as chair. So obviously this position means a lot to me, the board means a lot to me. Um, so I wanna first of all say hi and welcome and thank you all for your involvement. Um, I'm remaining on the board. My question is really for all three candidates um, and it deals with term limits. Um, and I'd like to know for committee chairs on the board, something that was developed a long time ago um, when I first joined the board was that committee chairs were, um, were term limited to six years as a chair. And I would like to know from each of the candidates if you expect that to continue and the term li limit rule to be uh, enacted under your chairmanship. And then a specific question for the current chair is about uh, sort of the serving of a third year, which again, I think I was the first person to do, so I have a unique perspective on it. I think some people think I did it well, other people think it might have been a year too long. I'd like to know one specific initiative that you believe only you as chair would be able to carry out um, as chair in your third year that neither of the other two candidates would be able to do. Thanks. Okay, who goes first? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. First question about term limits for committee chairs. I'll do it. A couple of years ago, we were told that the movie chairs will have to be replaced in 2019. And uh, my co chair at the time and I accepted that, and we have mentored uh, committee members since then, anticipating that this rule would still be in effect in 2019, which we're just about there. So rather than do have a wait and see approach, we were proactive about mentoring committee members to be chairs in the future. Does that answer the question? Yeah, I'm just curious for all the candidates. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, you know, for the same reason that uh, Scott Stringer and Al expressed with respect to term limits for board members, not believe it's appropriate to have absolute firm term limits for committee members. I think that uh, introducing uh, new blood to the committees, changing committee chairs uh, when appropriate is a good thing. But I think a hard and fast rule uh, may produce uh, unintended and unfortunate results. So I would not be in favor of retaining the three-term three limit. This is there was a bylaw that was passed almost six years ago, and in that, um, in the bylaws, we had no term limits. At the um, board meeting where we were voting on on the bylaws, somebody introduced a resolution for term limits, and and the bylaws passed with term limits in it. While I have been chair of the board, there has been quite a bit of turnover on committee chairs. And we have um, a whole bunch of new committee chairs in the last two or three years, some of which happened in Elizabeth's chair and some of it's happened in mine. Um, whatever the board decides is what I would go with. I would not. Um, I will follow the bylaws. 
And the second question, which is what initiatives that I can do that, that I have um, several initiatives that I've been working on, including working with a whole group of uh, community organizations, citywide, our elected officials, Helen Gale, um, all the other community boards in Manhattan, on the initiative on, on super talls, two talls, you know, in um, Inwood, a 25 foot story building is too tall, you know, so it's all relative. Um, we, we've been working really hard. We have a good working coalition um, and, and I really want, would like to continue working on that. I've also established good working relationships with some of the institutions in our community that we've not had working relationships with, sort of connecting the dots between different groups so that we work more effectively. I have brought board members to meet with Rod Jones from Dr. Riverside. I've brought board members to meet with the executive director of Lincoln Center. And now that there's going to be a new director, we'll, we'll have another meeting. So I think on that regard, and several others, but I'm leave it with those two. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, thank you. Okay, so now we're going to hear from the vice chairs. The first is going to be Molly. Good evening. Um, for the record, my name is Polly Spain, and I am a candidate for the position of vice chair for Community Board 7. And I'd like to talk about the fact that uh, professionally, for the past 20 years, I've been a special education teacher for the New York City Department of Education, and I have worked diligently to help those students between the ages of five to 21 years of age to overcome challenges uh, when it comes to academics. A lot of the uh, young people that I've worked with have been unfortunately uh, victims of egregious issues such as sexual abuse, emotional abuse, homelessness, and also newly arrived people in the country. So, and you can understand with that kind of uh, challenge, you know, I've been able to make lemons out of lemonade, okay? As a civic leader for the past 10 years, I have been a, I mean, lemonade out of lemonade, lemonade out of lemons. thank you. All right, gotcha. All right, so for the past 10 years as a civic leader, I have served as the president of a public housing complex here in the Upper West Side. And during that tenure, I've also reached out to seven other president leaders, and we formed a group called the Federal Eight, resident associations. And through that group, we were able to bring uh, free Wi-Fi to our campuses here at Y Consolidation here on the Upper West Side. And also, in addition to that, we were able to start a resident watch program. And through that program, we were able to work along with the NYPD to um, solve issues in our campuses, and also to uh, work with the NYPD to make it easier for them to do verticals so they're able to look on their iPad or their phone uh, at the public space areas and with the Wi-Fi, of course, educational programs. And so therefore the residents have control of that situation. And we also have a website called federalaid.org if you want to check it out. I'm very proud also to say I'm currently the treasurer of the PSA 6 Community Council, which is under the housing group of the NYPD. And I'm very active in raising money for the different programs, such as the Explorers Program, and also the NCO offices that we have. Um, the PSA 6 Community Council covers the range from 94th Street all the way up to uh, 155th Street in the whole grounds. I'm very proud to say we have over 50 to 60 members and we feed them at every meeting. They get a three square meal. Um, there's a lot of congeniality and then also through that relationship, I also have been the Vice Chair of Manhattan South District Council President. I worked with the New York City Housing Authority, sat down with executive vice presidents and chairs to create a five-year annual plan which is submitted to HUD every year. And so therefore, through that experience, I brought that to work along with Madeline Innocent to launch the Public Housing Task Force. I've used that background experience to work as a co-chair and a chair of the Housing Committee of the CP7. In addition to that, I want to say thank you for your, uh, thank you for your support. Thank you, Audrey. Good evening, everybody. If 
you don't know me, I'm Audrey Isaac. Yes. Good evening, everybody. I'm Audrey Isaac, running for vice chair. Many, many things that I've done in Community Board 7 have been extremely deeply meaningful to me. But I want to talk about just a few things that are the most meaningful to me. The developers are like vultures in our district ready to tear down the five-story walk-ups between 100 and 110 and develop, and develop expensive housing, just like the housing in Riverside South. CB7 got $50 million to build affordable housing in the district. And uh, we have a, a, a plan to develop, to tear down garages on 108th Street city-owned property and develop supportive housing for formerly homeless people, et cetera, to be run by the West Side uh, Federation of Senior and Supportive Housing. We had new York hearings last December and November in particular. And at one point, because the people who were in the low market rate parking spots in the garages on the site were zealous in their opposition, Wishfish made an HPD made a proposal to defer tearing down the easternmost parking lot and keep it for five years. At a certain point in the hearings, it became apparent to me that that was not a hard and fast offering. So at that point, I reached out to some other people on the board and I said, why don't we try to get all of the uh, parking lots torn down immediately because to hold off for five years created a problem where we might have a new mayor who did not share the current mayor's commitment to affordable housing. And I was thrilled that working with other people on the board, the board voted for immediate development of all the uh, garages into affordable housing. This was an extremely important development, and it really is the most meaningful thing I've done on this board. Also, I proposed the Diversity and Inclusion Committee, which was passed. I uh, proposed with Polly Spain a, refer a referendum, uh, excuse me, a resolution opposing the Constitutional Convention for New York State. And also, I organized two panels, took a lot of work with Shelly Klein for the Health and Human Services Committee. There were other efforts I tried to do. They haven't succeeded yet, but uh, all of these things I did in the past year and they've been extremely meaningful to me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Devity, I cannot speak of on the board. I literally was at my second meeting last year when I was asked, will you run for co-secretary? I didn't know what I was getting into, but I said, sure, I'll do it. But my experience started with the community board by meeting Blanche and getting involved in talking about middle school resources and the lack of them above 100th Street. And she really influenced me. She inspired me as well as some other people that I know who are on other community boards to do this. And when I did this, I was unmarried, did not have a child. Um, and did not think that I would love it as much as I did or that my life would take me on a different road. But right now as a brand new mom, there is nothing I want more than to be with my child. But I still really look forward to every single one of these meetings by being an activist, by talking about the issues above 100th Street. We don't always have them represented in this room. I've given 15 years to working with that community in a social service agency working with the schools. About two years ago, I had the honor of taking care of my niece while my mother, while my sister was serving overseas for the military. And I walked into PS87 and realized that there was a huge disparity between PS87 and the schools above 100th Street. And I had multiple conversations with a lovely principal there. And it really motivated me to want to get more involved, to really advocate for those people. Madeline talked about housing. I am in a NYCHA facility at Frederick Douglass. I can't tell you how many times I'm at the respiratory doctor because my ceilings are falling down and leaking. 
and what I have in my community center is nothing compared to what the residents of those buildings look through. So I am here to advocate for them. I also live in the 70s, so I have that perspective where I realize how privileged I am because I live in the 70s and the resources that are there, how different that is than my clients. I want to support the chair, whoever that is that's elected. I also want to be a liaison between board members and the chairs to make sure that as a board, we are working together and that we are getting along to work together. As people have said, we're a strong board and we have a big voice and we should use it for the positive. So I'd be really honored to get this position and work with it. Um, and that's all I can say. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Thank you. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm Andrew Ritchie. I just wanted to say I love the Upper West Side. I actually was appointed to the board and then moved out of the district. And then within one year, literally to the day, came back and had the opportunity to be back on the board. And that was such a critical decision in me moving back into the neighborhood. You know, 36 years old, I run a I found and run a nonprofit association to represent small businesses throughout the city. Literally, you can't walk down a block in our neighborhood without seeing a vacant storefront. My wife is a professor for CUNY. We have a three-year-old daughter, loves going to Metro Diner, and now she loves to sit up on the counter. She's a really big girl. Point being is my generation, I believe, is vital and critical to the current and future livability to our neighborhood. And I will represent that on the board as a vice chair. I also have years of experience hosting current event groups at JASA 76. Uh, my mom was a program director at Penn South, so I understand the issues that everyone or many people in our communities face. Um, but it's not just about what I bring. I know everyone is just a wealth of knowledge and a brain trust. What I know how to do really well, I believe, is hosting effective and efficient meetings. And I will contribute to the chair, whoever that may be, uh, whatever I can do to make sure that people come to these meetings, both the members and the public, and find their use of time was meaningful. Whether it's big or small, I mean, a small thing I would just say, but has a big impact, or the name tags. I would love it to say first name and last name, because sometimes I don't know everyone's first name, just their first initial. So that would be one little thing that would be important. When there's other issues, for instance, when I moved onto my building on 100th Street, there was for one year people complaining about a grate that was broken. The super, everyone was trying to get something done. Literally within 24 hours, I got Con Ed out there and they fixed it. That's what I do in my business. Every single day, I help small business owners break through the bureaucracy of the city and help them. And even if I can't help, I'll be there to support them. And I swear to all of you, I'll be there to support all of you, many whom I've had the pleasure of working with. I hope feel that I am there to support them, um, to push them for better or worse in different ways so we can come up with the best ideas for our committee. And I just think if you provide me this opportunity that I will do everything I can possibly do and make you happy and proud that you said, Andrew would be a good vice chair for a term. So I want to thank you all very much. Have a great evening and good luck to everyone. Members have 46 members present. Wow. Okay. So, give me the well, first, let's see if anybody has any questions for the for the for the candidates for vice chair. <laughs> Nobody has a question. Who said that? I didn't. <laughs> 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 just a reminder for the co-secretaries, Ms. Lolita and Sarah, just raise your hand so everybody can see who you are. Okay. And uh, so you said we have 40, 46. 46. 46. So we're gonna need so we're gonna we're gonna give everybody five minutes to vote. Um we vote for one person per chair, two up to two for vice chair, and up to two. For co-secretary, and just a reminder, even though the two people for co-secretary are running unopposed, if you choose to vote, you still need to vote for them so they can get a majority. Um, if you have any questions, again, don't hesitate to ask. And make sure and make sure 
um, that you sign the ballot for this round, it is round one. And if you could also just initial your, your name on the outside of the ballot, that would be great. Next to your name on the outside. We're putting our initials out there? Yeah. Okay. Just make, just make sure that you sign round one. Again, one candidate for chair, up to two for vice chair, and up to two for co secretary. We also have a representative from, from the borough president's office will be observing uh, the counting of the votes. Thank you. Um, you know what, you're always prepared. Sometimes I used to have a recording. Thank you. You all try to get out of the I got a Thank you. 
I've never been to therapy before, so I never really thought about it. Um, I have. I have a friend who is really into the whole like uh, the whole uh, like uh, the whole 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 like uh, the and they don't show up twice. Oh, and they still have to get another chair. I was telling you that. Because that's my path to the park. And it's many minutes. And it's black. I don't remember when the Italian restaurant is going that far. Or maybe they were better about it. No, they are a city. They are a city. I said that I was like, I can't get the school in here. Maybe it's over. I don't know. No, no, no. She's doing and the new family member she's involved with, and I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
to say. I mean, we, we have the most amazing committee, and we do really hard work, really thoughtful work, and everybody on the committee really gives it their all. And we represent many different opinions, and we have some committee members that moved on to other committees, maybe some want to come back because we're a small committee. Louisa? Um, <laughs> but it's, it really, you know, I, I will miss that, I will miss the board, but I really um, appreciate all this. So now, I guess as reward for leaving, um, I get to go first for a change <laughs> instead of being like, like yeah. um, and, this, and our our committee meeting this week because of the holidays this month. We just met last Thursday, so it's fairly fresh in my mind. So this first application is 91 Sunset Park West, and it's an interesting application because it came before us about a year or 18 months ago. Um, it's, it, the gist of it is, it's a penthouse application, tiny bit visible from way across the park, but there's some very special windows, which is why, that they're proposing to change, which is why it comes came before us the last time, and we turned it down, and now the applicant came back to us. So now with that said, let's go through it. This is 91 CPW. Um, can we go to the next one, Jerry, please? <clears throat> okay, so this is giving us an idea of it has decorative stained glass in the windows, all the ones that are marked red. Um, our, the apartment under uh, discussion is the one that faces, um, I forget what the cross street is, and Central Park West. The blue windows are the cool, clear glass, the non-decorative elements, um, most of which are in the in adjacent apartment. And part of the applicant's argument for why they wanted to change it was to, quote, unify it in making it clear glass. Um, the other point is that at the time when they initially presented this application to us, we were all under the impression they were original to the building, and in fact, they now are claiming they weren't original to the building, but they were clearly of that era, and they made them. Um, they are special, unique, distinct, and there are often times when things were changed shortly thereafter and became an important part of um, the architecture of the building. So let's go to the next. So this is, okay, this is, uh, um, We'll, we'll be seeing a series of these, but over on the left is the existing set of windows. And they have, in some cases, they have glass that's, um, you know, these are just clear glass with leading, which at the, at the proposal was, in this case, I think this is the one window we thought was reasonable. They wanted to raise the handsome to the height of everything else. Um, and this is what they came to before before us with last time, we turned it down. Landmarks has subsequently approved it. So the middle is what they're saying is the approved proposal. And now they are coming back to us and saying, no, 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 we want to modify the application. They haven't done the work yet to make it completely clear of us. And the argument is it's a better view. And it's not visible from the street and it's not original. Let's go to the next one. We'll just quickly go through it. So these are the decorative elements. And so originally, um, this is what's the existing condition, which if you can see some of the glass is cracked, but also some of it is it not only modeled, which was original, but also sometimes slightly discolored. And so the proposal last um, time was they originally wanted to remove the decorative elements and just keep the leading in, in nuclear glass. And Landmarks made them at least keep the decorative elements. Um, this is what they want to do with it instead. <laughs> Let's just go because uh, again, this is existing, landmarks approved, so not yet done, but what would be um, done if they would do the, follow the letter, and this is what they want. Next, again, beautiful decorative elements, clear glass, which we almost couldn't say yes to, um, and then what's proposed. Next, and again, Next, and again, and they, they proposed, it's interesting, the building had that the co-op board president came in and surprisingly <coughs> supportive of the change and said they would do everything they could to find a new home for the stained glass elements, but then said that nobody wanted it because they weren't original, which they're not, but they are, a, 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 a neighbor on the block spoke about the, um, the, who was involved in historic preservation and uh, as a preservation center symbolic importance in the city of New York of these kinds of elements and it would be not to lose them. Again, next, 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 more decisions. Is that it? So um, our committee disapproved. And so our resolution is to disapprove the application to modify the approved, landmarks approved, but not CD7 approved, this 
to this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So the one thing I want to add to what Gabby said is that a year ago they came seeking something very similar to what they're seeking now, and there was a compromise struck. So in addition to the architectural or preservation arguments that Gabby has very ably outlined, I am butchered by repeating. I am concerned about the precedent that it sets for us to give a little more, give a little more, give a little more just for asking. That it sets a bad precedent that if you don't get everything you want from the community board or the LPC or any other city agency, just keep asking and then eventually you'll get what you, what you, what you need or want. We, uh, I personally think that the compromise that's the middle on all of these things is a compromise. I didn't vote for it, but I can understand where it came from. And it is the essence of compromise is that everybody walks away equally unhappy. Um, and so if, in this case, the applicant walked away equally unhappy and now wants another shot at the apple, I don't think we should give it to him. Yeah. I feel similarly. Um, um, this is um, an example of a pretty uh, astonishing stained glass. And while it's not in the cathedral and the public can't enjoy it, it seems a shame to demolish it all simply because somebody is coming back for another bite at the apple. So I agree with um, what our committee decided to now. I just want to say I live at 80 Central Park West. I could see these windows from where I live but I can't see them from the street. So given that people can't see them, I don't understand why people can't change their windows as they see fit. This is not visible to the street. Again, it's visible to me, and there are very few people like me who actually see these windows. So I, I don't see why they shouldn't be able to change them. Invite us to your house. <laughs> <laughs> well, they change them, there's no point. One thing to understand about my is the reason, the reason they that they had to come to us and that it couldn't be approved at staff level is that even though it's not visible from the public way, except way across the park where it is, the planning is right. And then it is still, they're considered special things. And as such, landmarks can't without a public hearing. And but we represent the public and the, the, the perspective of our community can't just say across the board, sure, go ahead and change it. And it's a piece of history, and not all history is completely visible everywhere. So that's another thought. All right. Um, is this on? Yeah. Are the others of the apartment here? Then I can say, like, I can't believe they want to get rid of them. They don't deserve them. Um, but that said, they're not visible by the community. And I don't, I, it seems, immensely intrusive into people's private property to not approve it. Although I hate to say that. And please talk me out of it. I went to your meeting. I was similarly upset about the fact that they keep chipping away at, at uh, your good work and that of LPC. Then I started to wonder, will they make their application and say something about the fact that this these are leaded windows. Will that affect LPC's decision? Because they're leaded windows, and if they have children, oh, I'm just asking. It's not the same kind of lead. What what's lead? Oh, so it's not the it's not a leaded Gabby. I see. It's not the stuff that's been, I don't even know if it's been in there anymore. Okay, I'm, I'm, thank you for clearing that up. I didn't know. I heard lead. I thought uh, the same as in lead paint. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. This is very fair enough. I, I don't want to reach out. I'd like to make a couple of points about these windows. Not only is it disturbing that they think they can keep chipping away at us and somehow. You know, you know, death by a thousand little cuts. This is a very special apartment. The windows are considered special windows by the Landmarks Commission, and the building itself is landmark. So it has a very different 
set of rules, so to speak, that it would be if you came by my apartment building and somebody had had a stained glass window and decided to take the window out. And it was, you know, somebody had put it in 40 years ago. This was put in at some time when the building was built. What the historic preservationist who spoke to us said is they're not antique windows. They're not from the 16th century. They are part of a Renaissance movement that was very prevalent on the Upper West Side for some time. And this Renaissance feeling is what they were looking for when they designed these windows. So they are part of the fabric of the building and of the structure itself. If they don't like the windows, they shouldn't have bought the apartment. If they bought the apartment, they should have bought it. In my own personal opinion, but I'm, I'm asking you all to support our committee. Thank you. I have another way of asking the same question or the same comment that Mark asked, which is they came to the board about a year ago. The board turned them down. They went behind our back to LPC. Got them well, no, they're allowed to, but they went to LPC with our disapproval. But what has changed since they came back to us once we've already disapproved them? Well, it's what? Sorry, I didn't hear. It was for sale. Like this was in your honor. The one of the arguments, and, and to their credit, they didn't they didn't emphasize that as the main reason. But one of their arguments was that the apartment is for sale, and they're having difficulty selling the apartment because the windows that are decorative with stained glass and leaded glass are obstructing the view. I mean, obviously, we unanimously disapproved it, so we didn't give a lot of credence to that argument, um, purely out of, um, out of curiosity, like most of us in Manhattan, I'm slightly addicted to real estate porn. So I, I looked on streaming, and the first entry that I saw was that the apartment had been sold for $18 million. Uh, I did check it again just within hours, and now it says it's unavailable. So I don't really know what the uh, what the status is, but we, we, didn't, we don't give credence to that argument. It's something they have to deal with. I'm just wondering if this is similar to the BLA issue or the SLA issue we had um, a few meetings ago where the um, side street restaurant where we knew if we denied it, the state liquor authority would still give them give them the liquor license. So we approved it with our conditions. Is there a concern here that if we disapprove this, they're still gonna let them do it? Well it's 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 it, it is a much different application. What, what LPC approved last time, even after our recommendation not to approve it was in some of the lighted glass windows there was there were discolored windows there were colored windows and what they allowed them to do was within the dividers replace it with clear glass so it was it was a matter of repair and enhancing the view somewhat by getting there were like an eye configuration of colored glass here. So this, I mean, this is a much more, this is a much more major change in the sense that all of this, whether it's original or not, it's historic. All of this stained glass, they're asking that all of it go. Um, and so, so just, to, just, just to be clear, the glasses are, the stained glass is not original to the building, but are we saying that they were on the other apartments in the penthouse or other windows in the building? No, or no, only don't. this apartment? No, you know, we, they said, and we think it is, nobody really knows for sure if this stained glass is original. What, what they said, and I, I think it's somewhat vague, is they said it wasn't renaissance or was it historical glass we don't know when it was installed but it's what's an hour to the time of the building yeah. it's probably not the original 
original architectural drawings. So the other pimp house, did it have a oh, I'm sorry. No, the, the other, other pimp house. house the other pimp house. Originally. Prior, prior to uh, landmarks, removed all. Oh, but originally they had them too. We, we don't know. Um, and what one of the yeah. So, so, so a, a yes vote is to disapprove the application. So all, all in favor. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> okay, so we're going to the next application, which is going to be quicker. To the Riverside, this is an application for uh, some mechanical, uh, a bulkhead. This is a building at 93rd Street and Riverside. I'm sorry, 92nd and Riverside. There's an elevator bulkhead um, that's here. There's an elevator that exists in the building that is old and always coming up, falling apart. Apparently, parts are no longer available, and they need to. They can't do stuff internal to the shaft because it would reduce the, the cab size, which is already small. And so they're proposing a new mechanism that involves a new wheel house that will be erected on top. I'll show you in more detail, but on top of the existing bulkhead. And will expand a little out um, to the east. Can we go to the next one, please? So the orange on top is showing the addition, which is this real house. It's eight feet tall, which is the minimum it can be. You still get a person to work in there and have structure. Um, it, it is, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is showing the elevations along the drive and, and in the back as well. And, and they're straight on elevations, so it looks like it's an enormous addition. In fact, it is only visible. Is there another picture, Jerry? Mm -hmm. Okay. It is only visible at the times that the existing ele uh, elevator um, mechanism or bulkhead is there, not any other time. And it is minimally visible. And it is one of those background utilitarian architectures that we see that go along with all the um, water towers and such, our buildings all over. So our committee found it to be minimal. 